Hope Love, the broadcast ministry of Calvary Chapel Birmingham in beautiful Alabama. I am so glad you've chosen to join us as we explore the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Through this ministry, we are reaching thousands around the world with the amazing, exciting, and life-changing Word of God. To learn more about Calvary Chapel Birmingham and God's plan for your life, or how you can partner with this ministry, go to calvarybirmingham.com. Today, God has an extra special message just for you. So grab a cup of coffee, pull up a comfy chair, open your Bible, and let's dig in. pray. Lord, we thank you for this evening that we can gather together and that we can dig into your word. And we just ask that as we dig into your word that you would open it up for us, Lord. We ask that you would plant seeds in our heart, that those seeds would take root, and that we would be filled and overflow of our abundance into the lives of others. Lord, give us opportunities this week to share with others, to be a light uh, in a dark place. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Henry, who was, well, let's say he was elderly. He was unhappy. He had a favorite hat, and he had lost it. Could not remember for the life of him where he had left that hat. He decided that in order to get a new one, he was going to go to church that Sunday. And he was just going to take one off of the coat rack and then sneak out. Well, when Henry arrived at the church, an usher saw him, introduced himself, and escorted him into the sanctuary before he had a chance to do anything. Wouldn't you know it, the pastor was teaching that morning on the Ten Commandments. After the service, Henry walked up to the pastor who was standing at the door as everybody was leaving, and he shook his hand, and he said, I want to thank you, pastor, for the service today. I came to church to steal a hat, and after hearing your sermon on the Ten Commandments, I decided against it. The pastor answered, you mean uh, you, heard the, you heard me teach on the commandment about thou shalt not steal, right? That changed your mind. And no, said Henry, the one about adultery did. As soon as you said that, I remembered where I left my old hat. <laughs> It'll, when you get home, you'll get that. There's a spot on Valleydale Road. You guys know this spot. There's a spot on Valleydale Road. And at traffic hour, you can be going down Valleydale, and every single time, there's a, a police officer sitting in his SUV off to the side clocking people. I mean, it's, it's, it's every single day you can count on him being there. And this is at that two-lane road part right off of 31 as it heads further down Valleydale there uh, just, uh, just after 65 where that second lane is getting ready to end. You know, and the traffic, because most people realize, well, that, that right-hand lane ends, traffic just builds up on that one, that left lane, you know. But, but people, of course, think, oh, I'm going to make it around this traffic, whatever, and they kick over into that right lane, and they accelerate through. And you can always tell people who, who don't drive Valleydale much, because you can see their brake lights up ahead. As soon as they see that cop <laughs> coming to a, just slowing, slowing down as fast as they can. And it's, it's kind of funny to watch as you're, you know, in line there watching them pass and slam on their brakes when they get up there. But, you know, it, it's not that people are ignorant of the speed limit. You know, it's not that they just have no clue. Oh, I, I'm assuming the speed limit 65 on this two-lane country road. It's that it doesn't matter. Um, it, it's, it's that they, they're... They've grown used to, to speeding and disregarding the speed limit until they see the officer, which reminds them that they could get a ticket for speeding. Many people would say that they are obedient to the laws of the land, but go on, you know, 10, 
15, 20 miles per hour over the, over the speed limit isn't that unusual of a thing anymore for most people. There's some laws that we would probably never break, however. Then there are those laws that we will break without a second thought. Yet when confronted with that possibility of being caught and charged with the crime, is immediate course change. It's a natural course of man with the sin nature. After getting away with breaking the law several times to continue to do so, even escalate into breaking more laws, sometimes we need to be reminded of the boundaries. In our study this evening, through Deuteronomy chapter 5, Moses here reiterates to this next generation of Israel the Ten Commandments. When they entered the land, when they do enter the land, they will find out the boundaries of the land that God has given to each tribe. But there are other boundaries that they need to be reminded of. That's the law that God has given them. Some of those laws were for their time in wandering in the wilderness. Others added on to that for their time in the land or after they entered the land. They would need to know the laws when they entered the land so that while entering by the power of God, they did not try to live in the land by the power of the flesh. That sound familiar to you? Galatians 3.3 talks about having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? We will find out in our scripture for this evening, we'll find both encouragement and admonishment so that we also do not try to perform by the flesh that which God has performed by His Spirit. We're not going to make it through this whole chapter this evening. We've been plugging along pretty good in Deuteronomy so far, the one or two chapters a night. But we're going to slow down. We're going to hit the brakes a little bit in this chapter. Our goal for tonight's teaching is to be reminded to live extraordinarily for Christ. The first sermon in Moses of Moses in Deuteronomy to that generation of Israel that's going to enter into the promised land, that one ended with chapter 4. Now in that sermon, Moses reminded Israel of how God had seen them through everything that they had been through. They had experienced the chastisement of the Lord for their rebellion at Kadesh Barnea when they refused to enter the land. That generation had died off during those years of wandering in the wilderness due to their sin. But God had used that wandering to mold Israel into a nation that would enter the promised land. We should remember that when we sin and God chastises us, his motivation in doing so is to develop us into a more holy vessel. Isaiah 64, 8 says, We are the clay, and you are, and you our potter, and all we are the work of your hand. Sometimes God may break us to reform us. Sometimes he may speed up the wheel. Sometimes he may slow down the wheel. Sometimes other clay has to be added or a clump taken out. We should keep in mind that whether our heads are spinning or our hearts are breaking, we are in the hands of the perfect potter. He's forming us into the vessel of his choosing. And we can be confident of his words toward us that we will be greatly pleased by the final product of the work of his hands. Our plan for ourselves and God's plan for us, those may be two different things. We have clearly seen that when it comes to getting to the best place, obedience to God is the best way to go. And let's now enter into this second sermon of Moses, as recorded starting in Deuteronomy chapter 5. This time, it is a restating of the law to this new generation so that they will not only know the law, but understand the law and understand why they should obey 
the law. So Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting with verse 1, says, And Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak to your hearing today, that you may learn from them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. The Lord talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up to the mountain. So Moses begins his teaching with four important steps that we should take in regard to the word of God. These are four traits of a good student of Scripture as well. The first is to hear. The second is to learn. The third is to keep. And finally, the fourth is to do. These things are important if we are to be extraordinary in our following of Jesus. This evening, I hope for us to be able to talk at least about the first two. But the last two, I think we're going to hold off on until our next Wednesday evening service. Now, sometimes when sharing the gospel with someone, they respond in a way maybe like this. Well, I've kept the Ten Commandments. Or I've kept most of the Ten Commandments. Or I've kept at least a few of the Ten Commandments. And their meaning by that is that, that, hey, you know, they're believing that good enough is going to be good enough, right? The problem with this is that when it comes to the Ten Commandments, we cannot keep them perfectly. So they have to hope, and that's all they can do, hope that good enough is good enough. Is good enough good enough? Our righteous and holy God's righteous and holy requirement for keeping the law is perfect. That's something we can't do. So those who say that they live by the Ten Commandments, they may like them. They may think, oh, these are really quite good. I, I agree with these. But they by no means are able to to keep them. God in his word has made it very clear that people are not saved by the law. Paul said in Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. There's nothing wrong with the law. There's something very wrong with us. Nobody, since the fall, is able in this life perfectly to keep the commandments of God, but does daily break them in thought, word, and deed. That is, with the exception, of course, of Jesus Christ. There's no one who is justified by the law because there is no one who is able to do the works of the law. Paul, in Galatians, he went on to explain. In chapter 3, verse 19, he said, What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Okay, so the law was added because of sin, but the law can only bring awareness and condemnation. So, then if we cannot be justified by the law, what was the purpose of the law in the first place? Paul answers that for us as well. In Galatians 3, 24 to 25, he said, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Now, the word that is used for schoolmaster or tutor, depending on your translation there in Galatians 3, is pi dagagos. That was a servant whose duty it was to take children to school. 
Too bad we all don't have one of those, right? <laughs> that would be awfully convenient. In the Roman household, there were slaves into whose custody the children were placed. So it was the slave who actually played the large part in raising the children. Now the slave would dress them, feed them, bathe them, even discipline them when necessary. Now obviously this would have been a very uh, highly trustworthy servant to be placed with this kind of responsibility. There would come a time when the servant was no longer capable of teaching the child, and that servant would then be responsible for leading that child to school. So Paul in Galatians 3 is saying that the law was our, our pedagogos who said, I cannot do anything more for you. I will take you by the hand and lead you to Christ. The slave was not the child's father who gave the child life, but the guardian, the disciplinarian, just as the law does not give life, but regulates life. Once the tutor has led us to school, we're no longer under the tutor. Once we've accepted Jesus, we are no longer under the law. But then we don't reject God's word, but we desire to hear it. We desire to learn it. We desire to keep it. We desire to do it because we desire to be pleasing to God. Extraordinary Christians desire to please God. Extraordinary Christians are good students who do those four things. And we're going to start this evening with hearing. To hear the word of God means your ears have to be open. And kindergarten teachers tell their students, put on your listening ears. That's because distractions come so easily to children, whether it's daydreaming or simply watching another student instead of listening to the teacher. As we grow, as we grow up, many of us, not all of us, but many of us, I didn't intentionally look over there, many of us learn the discipline needed to pay attention. But for some reason, when it comes to the Word of God, very often it's different. I don't know if you guys have, have noticed, you know, if not so much on Wednesday evenings, but on Sunday mornings, you know, when we have a few more people, it, it's usually, you know, once we start, once I start teaching the Word of God, that's when all the distractions start. That's, that's when the pen clicking starts, or the, the, somebody keeps walking in and out in the back, or, or, you know, or, or you hear the toilet flush, or whatever the case may be. You know, especially, you know, at the end, during an altar call, proclaiming the, the gospel at the end, man, that's really, I mean, Satan, he hates that. And he wants all the distractions. He wants to place those distractions in the room. You know, it's like, it, it reminds me of, uh, if, you, if you remember Ray Stevens and that song when the squirrel went, to, it went berserk in the, uh, the first self-righteous church. You know, if you ever saw that video, if you haven't, you can go to YouTube, it's there. Um, but, you know, it, it, people are going crazy in the church because the squirrel is crawling all up and down and around. And, and it starts to feel a little bit like that, you know. I mean, this, this perspective is a lot different than the perspective in the seats. You know, I, I see a lot more than people realize that I see. But Satan, he, he loves those distractions because Satan doesn't like for us to hear God's word taught. So he desires to do exactly what Jesus said in the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. He desires to steal away that which was sown. In Matthew 13, when Jesus tells this parable, I find it interesting how the disciples, they don't understand it, but they do a really good job of illustrating it by going to Jesus to ask him to explain it to them. In his explanation, 
in verse 19, Jesus said, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. Now the Greek word for understanding there means to realize to the point of insight. The disciples heard Jesus share the parable, but they didn't understand it. So they went to Jesus to gain insight. When we come here together, desiring to learn the word of God, it doesn't mean much if we leave here without asking God to bring us understanding. You see, insight doesn't come when we hear and we just walk away. Insight comes when we hear and ask the Lord to bring us understanding. I think there are a lot of people who congregate to life coach kind of teaching because the pastor tells them something like, do something that makes you happy because, you know what, God wants you to be happy. But you see where that sends us looking for insight. That sends us to ourselves. Hey, me. What makes you happy? But we should instead, by seeking our insight about God's God's word, we should instead go to Jesus, go to the Lord to seek insight. That's where we're going to find the insight. The disciples understood Jesus' parable not because they were super smart, because they were super spiritual. They understood because they went to Jesus to gain understanding. The Word of God should always lead us to Christ. If it starts pointing us to ourselves, then we've got a problem. Now, God chose to give the law to Israel through Moses. And Moses tells Israel in verse 5 that at the giving of the law, God spoke to them face to face from the midst of the fire on Mount Sinai. But Moses stood between the Lord and Israel at that time to declare To them, his word. God brought grace to the world through Jesus, as John 1.17 says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We're going to hit a little bit more on this here in a moment. We're going to pause right now from our chapter because I believe any discussion on the Ten Commandments should be prefaced with what Jesus said in Matthew 22. Starting with verse 36, Jesus, excuse me, starting with verse 36, says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All of the law hangs on this. Loving God. And you cannot truly love God and exclude loving others. This is important because while the law is good for pointing others to Jesus, it's to be used in love. There are those who feel that there are certain methods that should be used when presenting the gospel. And one of those is to use the law, as Jesus did with the the young man who asked what he needed to do to get into heaven, and the Samaritan woman by the well also. But the danger is to wield the law out of pride or out of some desire to prove yourself instead of out of love. You know, don't be that person. You cannot stand between someone and Jesus and point them to him. You have to step aside and point them to Jesus and allow what has been poured into you through Scripture to pour out. If we are reading God's Word, listening to God speak, and committing his words to memory, we will sound more like our Lord when we speak. In other words, we will speak the truth and we will speak out of love. 1 Corinthians 13.1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I've become as sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. 
Speak the truth in love. So returning to our chapter, hearing is important. But that leaves learning, keeping, and doing. And we'll get to those three as we continue into our chapter. Verse 6 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. God is reminding Israel of how he has led them, protected them, provided for them. God is letting them know who he is in relation to who they are. He is their God. They are his people whom he has freed from bondage. It's good to consider just who you are with Jesus as your Savior. The Bible tells us that Christians are adopted as sons and daughters of God. Not only that, but we are now heirs to the riches of Christ. We are referred in the, to in the Bible as kings and priests. The Bible says we are beloved of God. Romans 8.1 says that we are no longer under condemnation. We do not receive Jesus and then we no longer struggle with sin. I wish that was the case. We should sin less, but we are far from sinless. So as we study through the law, let's be careful not to forget who we are in Christ. When John 3.16 says that God so loved the world, it was talking about a world that needs God. We need to remember that while we talk about the Ten Commandments because we probably think of people, when we read through these, we probably think of people who don't know Jesus or who say maybe that they are Christians, but they live as anything but. Perhaps, perhaps we are that person. <laughs> Our inclination might be to use the law unlawfully. Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.8, the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So there is a way in which the law is used that is lawful and good. And there is a way it can be used that is not. Paul went on to explain that in 1 Timothy 1, to explain that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. It's interesting to me that in Paul's list of those things for whom the law was made, we find that statement. Things that are contrary to sound doctrine according to the gospel. One way to use the law unlawfully would be to say that it is okay for a Christian to live an unrepentant, sinful lifestyle because they are forgiven. Paul says to do that is to choose to live under the law. Perhaps such a person was never saved to begin with or will enter the, the kingdom of heaven, as Paul puts it, with little to his name, all, as if having escaped a fire. To use the law unlawfully would also be to place it upon those who have been declared righteous in the eyes of God by the imputed righteousness of His Son, Jesus. To use the law unlawfully would also be to tell an unbeliever that they need to get themselves clean rather than looking to God's Son, Jesus, to make them clean. God gave the law. And yet the Bible majors on God's grace. Even the law is to make us aware of sin, of punishment for sin, and of God's Son, Jesus, who paid the price for our sin. God is righteous, 
No unrighteousness can survive in his presence. Yet God did not give the law so that he can be justified in his wrath against sin. The law does not hinge on the wrath of God. If it had, there would be no purpose for it. God is right and just in all he does. God could at any time exercise his wrath against the world. Yet he bears long and he is slow to anger. Long-suffering is proof of God's goodness, of his faithfulness, and is evidence of his desire to grant us salvation. Romans 2, 4 says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Forbearance is defined as a creditor's giving of indulgence after the day originally fixed for payment. Long-suffering is defined as enduring injury, trouble, or provocation long and patiently. In Joel chapter 2, verse 13, it says, So rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. God relents from doing harm. His long-suffering is seen in his gracious restraint of his wrath toward those who deserve it. Unlike man, God has the end in view. He has true insight. He knows what is best. And he is not moved by human emotions. Many Christians carry around this notion that God's just waiting around with his smite stick you know, waiting for us to make a mistake. God is not hiding around the corner setting booby traps for us. He's rooting for you. He wants you to succeed. Now, I say success, but we need to define success because I'm not talking about, you know, getting the job you want. I'm not talking about making the income you want or even living the life you want. I'm talking about you living the life God wants you to live. One that magnifies and glorifies him and leads you to his best for you rather than to seek out your own desires. You know, and God has really, he set us up for this. He's justified us. He's sanctifying us. He's filled us with the, the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit and he's given us eternal life. In addition to that, he doesn't even expect us to live by our own sufficiency, but by the power he supplies. Now, we've already talked about Moses' first admonition to Israel, that is to hear the word of God. His second admonition is to learn it. And we may hear the word of God and, and go to the Lord to seek understanding, which is exactly what we should do. But we also need to be acquainted with what God says. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time learning something that I don't practice. I imagine it's the same with you. A good example of, of that is language. You know, a second, third, some people will speak tremendous numbers of languages. Hola. Uh, Farfik Nugan, you know. Uh huh. See, we're we're all. <laughs> but you know, with language, you, you can you can go to school for years and learn a second or third language, but then twenty years down the road, if you haven't used it since then, <laughs> you're not going to remember, but very little of it. You certainly won't be able to hold your own in a conversation. You have to practice it. You have to use that language. You know, it's, it's not good for us to know just enough of God's word to get by. The very nature of the Bible, that it is the literal word of God. It, it, God, creator of the universe, who sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, that should make it an absolute treasure to us, something that we are passionate about. 
It should not be something we can get by even a day without searching it out and exploring its depths. We may hear the word of God, but if we are not learning his word, then we will not be able to keep them and do them. I think it was last week that we talked about Psalm 119 and in relation to chapter 4 of Deuteronomy. I think we should turn back there for a moment. We find words in Psalm 119 about the benefits that we receive from God's Word. In verse 1, we find the Hebrew word ashra from ashar means happy. And the same in verse 2, happy are those who walk in God's Word and who keep His Word. In verse 14, we find sus, meaning delight or rejoice in the way of God's word. We, we find delight, we find rejoicing in God's word. In verse 18, we find galah, meaning revelation, wonderful things being revealed through God's word. In verse 25, we find Chaya, not Chaya, because I knew everybody was thinking that. We find Chaya. Meaning, he's from Florida, of course he thinks that. Meaning living and, and returning to life. We are revived in God's word. That word for living, Chaya, is constructed from the word for life, which is Chai. Now, Chai, the word for life, is an interesting word in that when you look at it, written out in Hebrew, we see the image of a lamb. Chai is the root word from which is constructed to Chaya, Hebrew for resurrection. So from the lamb, we have resurrection unto life. Okay, so the Hebrew word for life, chai, which again is a picture of a lamb, requires the Hebrew letter tav to become the Hebrew word for resurrection. Now, the modern day tav, which you guys have probably seen before, is much different. It's been stylized differently over the years from the ancient tav. The ancient tav is a cross. So the Hebrew word for life, chai, a picture of a lamb, takes on the tav, a cross, to become the Hebrew word for resurrection. The Hebrew word for living is chaya, comes from chai, the lamb that was resurrected. You are not living until you are living in Christ Jesus. Now I tell you this, and I point this out to you, to emphasize that there is so much for us to explore and learn in God's Word. But no explorer sets out just to see. If we are going to explore the depths of God's incredible Word, we also set out to learn it. And we magnify God in doing so. Many people, including Christians, have concluded that the Old Testament and the commandments are out of date. Today, the world thinks that morality is something that changes and adapts as the times change. But these commandments, they don't change. Whether they're displayed in the courtroom or not, no matter how far no matter how far away people try to hide these commandments of God, sin is sin. It doesn't matter how sophisticated the sin or how sophisticated the sinner. Sin is sin, and it cannot be forgiven apart from Jesus. Jesus. 
Turning back to Deuteronomy 5. In verse 7, it says, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down for them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. God addresses idolatry and and to a larger degree polytheism here, the belief that there is more than one God. We have to remember that atheism is not something that somebody back in that time would have been aware of. It didn't exist. You know, people back then naturally assumed that there was a God. And of course, they also had the option of creating idols out of parts of the creation and worshiping them. So God is addressing polytheism here. And polytheism is the belief that there is more than one God. That was uh, prevalent in that day. It was the popular belief. Now today, the popular belief is that there is no God. Through my life, I've known a lot of people who considered themselves to be atheists, professors, teachers, musicians. Many of my closest and and dearest friends growing up would probably have described themselves as atheists. Atheism is the belief that God does not exist. Now, the problem with atheism is that those who claim the title, whether they realize it or not, are claiming to have full knowledge of everything. I don't believe there is such thing as a true atheist. If you know someone who goes, who calls themselves an atheist, ask them a few questions. What is the total number of hairs that are on the the claw of the Yeti crab? What is the combined weight of the sand on all the beaches of the world? Or perhaps, you know, ask them something that is knowable. What is the color of hippo milk? Or did Cleopatra live closer to the invention of the iPhone or to the building of the Great Pyramid? The answer to that is the iPhone. The answer to the hippo thing is pink. I think it's reasonable to conclude that there are some holes in every person's knowledge. We might could say that someone knows 1% of the knowledge of the universe, or we could be really gracious and say someone knows 2% of the knowledge of the universe. To know 100% would mean that they are intimately acquainted with every rock, grain, or, or sand, or drop of water in the whole earth, in the whole universe. So if an atheist knows an astounding 2% of everything there is to know, we can certainly say there is another 98% that he does not know. To say there is no God in the light of that overwhelming ignorance is absolutely foolish. But isn't that what Psalm 53.1 says? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. We're going to stop there for the evening. There are a couple of things in here that, uh, that really challenged me today. Those two things were probably exactly what you would expect because they probably challenged you as well. That is... truly listening to the Word of God, taking the time without distraction to hear the Word of God, and then also learning, not assuming you know it all.
And I'm challenged by those two things. It might surprise you to hear a pastor saying, hey, you know what? I am challenged by hearing God's word and I am challenged by learning his word. But I am. There's stuff in there that I read and my mind immediately wants to say, that can't be right. Yet that's the word of God. I'm creator of the universe. There's not a thing in this Bible that is incomplete or incorrect. There's no inconsistency. There's a whole heap and lot of inerrancy. And we can count on this word. We can count on all the things that God has said. One of the most precious to me, in light of the fact that we're over the next few weeks going to be looking at the Ten Commandments and continuing looking at the law, one of the most precious things in the Word of God to me is Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. <laughs> For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for speaking to us this evening, and I thank you for challenging me. I thank you if you also challenged others that were here this evening. Lord, I pray that we would be doers of your word, not hearers only. And Lord, as we commit ourselves to hearing your word and to learning your word, to keeping your word and doing your word, I pray, Father, that you would open your word to us in ways that we have yet to see. That the immense depths of riches of your word would be opened up to us. Lord, we give you this evening, we give you, the, we give you our lives. I pray that we would each one here be found to say, here I am, Lord, use me. We love you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen.